people's response to the first dose of amphetamine. Again, very similar to what we've seen in our previous studies. Following the repeated drug exposure, they were then brought back to the now drug-paired PET imaging environment and then given an identical-looking placebo capsule. What you're seeing on the bottom panel is the evidence of conditioned dopamine release. That is, the uh, inert placebo capsule is now able to induce measurable dopamine release, um, slightly smaller than the drug effect, but uh, quantitatively really quite similar, again occurring preferentially within the ventral limbic striatal region. The next question, next question of interest has been whether this sensitization-like phenomena might occur in substance abusers. These data come from, the data I'm showing you here, come from the cocaine study that I showed you earlier. Uh, in essence, what we saw was that the greater the lifetime history of stimulant drug use on the street, the greater the cocaine-induced dopamine response, at least consistent with the possibility of sensitization occurring in relation to drug use on the street. Much to our surprise, though, when we attempted to replicate this study, and this time gave an amphetamine challenge, we saw the complete opposite association. That is, the greater the lifetime history of stimulant drug use on the street, the smaller the drug-induced dopamine response. I can't claim that we uh, predicted these differential associations a priori, but I've come to like them very much. The most parsimonious explanation that I've come up with is that it's related to the presence versus absence of drug-related cues. And that is, in the animal literature, when animals are given a repeated drug exposure, if they're given it in the presence of the drug-related cues, the sensitization response is expressed and perhaps even augmented, whereas if you give the animals a drug in a place where they've never received drug before, the sensitization response does not occur. In our human studies, this is very much was what was going on. In the cocaine study, we presented individuals with a mirror, a bag of powder, a razor blade, a straw. They then prepared the powder into a couple of equal lines and ingested it in their usual fashion. Which is to say, for a couple of minutes, they were immersed in a drug cue rich microenvironment. In comparison, in the amphetamine study, there is a complete absence of drug-related cues. The pill was encapsulated in a nondescript uh, container. None of the cues normally related to the drug-taking experience were there. Based on these observations, I recently proposed a bi-directional, dimensional model of the potential role of dopamine in drug-taking behavior. The proposal is that in the presence of drug-related cues, dopamine reactivity is elevated, and this enhances the motivation or drive to seek out rewards, including drugs themselves. In comparison, in the absence of drug-related cues, dopamine reactivity is actively inhibited, and this diminishes the ability to uh, sustain interest in rewards and seek out, uh, seek out uh, uh, motivationally relevant stimuli. Together, these bidirectional effects may play an important role in the progressive narrowing of interests commonly seen as people develop addiction-related problems. The last study that I'd like to tell you about attempted to look at whether each of these factors could be relevant for individuals selected on the basis of being at elevated risk for addiction. We looked at three groups of study, uh, three groups of subjects. This included a group of squeaky clean healthy controls who had never used a psychostimulant drug in, in, their, in their life. At the other extreme, were subjects recruited on the basis of having a dense, multi-generational family history of addiction-related problems. And then we had an intermediate group that were matched on drug use histories. Um, they'd started to use various types of stimulant drugs like the high-risk individuals, but had no family history of substance use problems as such. The question of interest that we hoped to get at was to perhaps pull out the differential contribution of familial risk versus prior, prior exposure to the drug itself. Um, as expected, um, or based because of the way we recruited them, they were all in their late teens and early 20s. Um, none, of course, of the healthy controls had any stimulant drug history, whereas the two drug-using groups were well-matched on their stimulant drug exposure. A number of interesting differences appeared uh, between these different groups. As a start, and this won't surprise this audience, 
those individuals at familial risk for addiction had had much more difficult childhoods, scored higher in an aversive childhood environment scale, although perhaps a bit more novel, is that this was different also when those individuals who were using just as many drugs um, but did not have this familial risk. Also interesting is that those at risk for addiction showed a much greater craving response when we actually gave them a drug challenge. Um, and this too was uh, different as compared to the low risk controls and those with a history of using drugs, but without it being at risk for addiction as such. The real question of interest was, would their dopamine response be different? The top panel here shows the uh, dopamine response in the healthy controls, again, very much like we've seen before, a statistically robust effect given the large sample size. Here's the dopamine response in the low, relatively low-risk family history negative drug users, a slightly smaller but not really significantly different um, effect in these individuals as such. And here's the response in those at high risk for addiction. Essentially nothing. Almost nothing at all. This puts, um, shows the, uh, the data in graph form and it make, makes it easy to compare the results. Again, what you can see is that a, really across the full striatum, but with particularly pronounced effects in the right limbic stri ventral striatum, those individuals at risk for addiction showed a markedly blunted dopamine response, at least under the conditions of this study, which is to say, given an amphetamine challenge, in the absence of any drug-related cues. So, in conclusion, um, this, these studies suggest the following main findings. First, they confirm that in healthy individuals, um, abuse substances across pharmacological classes do indeed increase dopamine transmission with preferential effects in the ventral uh, striatum. Second, these drug-induced dopamine responses increase the salience of reward-related cues and the willingness to work for them, but this is not due to a change in the pleasurable effects of, of, of the rewards, um, nor necessarily even related to subjective conscious craving as such. And I think this raises a number of interesting implications at the clinical level and may account, uh, at least in part, for why neuroleptics have not actually been effective treatments for addiction. Third, following repeated substance use, we see evidence of conditioned, sensitized, and cross-sensitized dopamine responses, differences that may account in large part for the progressive narrowing of interest seen as people develop addiction disorders, and also raising the possibility at the clinical level that a better treatment for addictions, at least treatments aimed at the dopamine system, may be modulators that uh, uh, can both augment without uh, creating dopamine spikes as opposed to simply shutting down the system. Fourth, we're seeing the first evidence of a disturbed dopamine response in individuals at risk for addiction. Uh, and this in and of itself, it's not due to past drug use because the subjects, this differential response is there even when we compare it to individuals with the same drug use histories. Finally, this combination of altered dopamine responsivity plus the greater cr conscious craving response could reflect what's sometimes called an endophenotype or vulnerability trait factor for addiction. Thank you.